announcement meeting. So before we get going, I shall just do the original um, announcements. So if I can remind everybody present that this meeting is being live streamed as well as recorded via the internet, and then this recording will be archived for future viewing. Could all participants please mute themselves when they're not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback when other participants are speaking? If a participant wishes to speak, can they please use the remote hand function? And if a participant raises their hand via this function and is not subsequently invited to speak by myself, please can they then turn their camera on to indicate or place a message in the chat function? When invited to speak by the chair, please could all participants ensure their microphone and the camera is on to ensure that they can both be seen and heard when actively participating. If it's not possible for any reason, bring this to my attention or to the Democratic Service Officer as soon as you can. If all debate could be conducted verbally, not via the chat function for the sake of this recording. The chat function should be used to highlight a technical issue and or to gain the attention of myself or the Democratic Services Officer. If any participant has difficulty hearing or being heard when they're addressing the committee, then they should let the chair or the Democratic Services Officer know. So if I can now please welcome all committee, non-committee elected members, cabinet members, our officers, and also if there are any people watching the live meeting broadcast. Okay, so if we can move on to part one, and that's our apologies for absence. Um, have we had any reported, please, Karen? No, Chair, everyone is online, all members are present, thank you. That's wonderful, thank you very much. Um, agenda item two, now this is declarations of interest and nature of such interest. So if you have any, please, uh, please could you say now? Okay. No, that's great. No, thank you very much. Let's move on to agenda item three then. Um, that is, um, I come from a reference of Cabinet on the 18th of July. Um, it's closure of accounts 2023-2024. Agenda item four is also um, the, the same report, closure of accounts 23-24. So um, what we'll do, we'll do both of these together because we would literally be repeating ourselves and going over the same report um, bar a couple of additional appendices. So if we can um, move across now to Matt Bomer for um, a little bit more insight into the report. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Evening, everyone. So this is the first of three outturn reports um, that came to Cabinet uh, on the 18th of January. Um, we didn't um, quite get them in time to come into the um, last cycle of scrutiny before the, the summer recess. So um, these are uh, a couple of months old now. Um, I'm just going to briefly spend three, four minutes. Um, I'll, I'll have the same approach with each of them. I'll, I'll spend three, four minutes in introducing them and then um, obviously uh, very happy to, to take questions. Um, so, um, you know, the headline is the, the year-end revenue position was a break-even position, um, but that was after net transfers uh, from reserves of £34 million. Um, quite understand that that gives a quite complex feel to the report, but what we have been is very transparent in setting out in the papers um, what those uh, transfers were and how they contributed to the overall position. Um, so there was 417k transferred from the, the council fund. There was just short of 13 million pounds, so 12.961 million pounds from the HRA reserves, and that's primarily funding the development program and improvements uh, to our housing stock. Um, we actually um, planned in the uh, budget strategy to use 3.296 million pounds of reserves helping smooth out some of the pressures, and that's been um, taken into account. Um, there were um, 11.893 million, so just short of 12 million pounds of transfers from specific reserves, um, and that was to provide uh, one-off funding for projects in a planned manner and also um, to manage overspends. 
Um, there was uh, £6.7 million transfers into specific reserves, so they in the other direction from revenue, and that includes £2 million to offset potential future deficits in schools, and that's the overall school reserves position, balance position. Um, during the year, we did actually transfer £4 million from school reserves, so we've seen um, a decline or a continued decline in uh, school reserves that we've seen since the end of the COVID pandemic and the extra resources that have gone into schools at those times. Um, and then uh, last on the reserves was the £8.8 .8 million uh, drawdown from reserves to fund the capital programme. And then again, um, that's uh, planned use of the, the reserves and uh, what had been expected to take place. Um, the uh, council fund now stands at £11 million um, as of the 31st of March, and that's totally in line with the policy position that we set out in, in the budget. Um, so a bit of um, a reminder, and you're probably familiar with this, that um, we have or did uh, encounter significant revenue pressures during 23-4, um, and we've been reporting those through to Cabinet and to you on a, on a quarterly basis. Year end was marginally better than the position uh, reported at the, the end of the first quarter. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, you'll remember that uh, particular pressures uh, were in uh, two sort of camps. Firstly, in respect to inflationary pressures uh, regarding contracts, pay pressures, and that includes cost of living, market pressures, and, and the council's commitment to pay in the real um, living wage, for example. And then on a service front, um, we've continued to experience significant demand pressures for supporting children's and adults social services, um, people experiencing homelessness, and um, continued pressure around pupils with additional learning needs and the cost of replacement cost and transport costs um, that arise due to that. Um, we've also um, had some experience um, of delays and constraints in delivering uh, what was quite a significant uh, savings target. Um, so partly countering that um, was more positive news on the position on policy budgets and council tax. Um, so we have had some upside on, on the policy with continued practice of internal borrowing for capital programme. And also um, what we did discover throughout the year was that the interest rates persisted at their high level. Um, and certainly there was benefit to the council then in terms of our investment returns. Um, and in year um, on collection of the council tax, so the in year collection, so the 23 four bills, um, we have the team has started um, or improving. Um, collection, we're, we're starting to hit the levels that we were pre-COVID, albeit a little bit behind what was set um, at the time of um, the budget, when the budget was agreed. However, um, the team has been really effective in collecting the historical debt, and that's what's driven the, the upside on, on the council tax line. And in both of those areas, we've we've taken some of that into the budget going forward in, in 24 5, but two, two areas that are particularly difficult to, to forecast. Um, I mentioned schools briefly. Um, schools outturned with a slightly more favourable position than we've been reporting during the year. Um, and that, that um, was welcome news, in part due to some additional grant um, coming through from Welsh uh, Government, but also down to the efforts of the schools and work that they've been doing with um, our education colleagues. Majority of schools um, did um, achieve a balanced budget at, at year end. Um, and at 31st of March, we had 22 schools in deficit. So that's just over 40% of our schools in deficit. Um, but encouragingly, the overall level of balances at schools was 2.3. So still collectively in surplus. Um, and I do know um, some neighbouring authorities, their schools are now in deficit collectively at that point in time. These, um, the point worth making as well, though, is that some, that's a global sum and it does mask some significant variances across individual schools with some schools with significant um, deficits and some 
conversely with significant balances. Uh, mentioned the savings. Uh, we did have uh, challenging savings efficiency targets, 23-4. Uh, the progress has been good. Um, where there's been failure to deliver in total, there's been some mitigation, and we'll uh, keep those uh, savings under review in 24-5 as services move to identify them on a more sustainable basis over, over the medium term. Um, as I said, there was slight upside at year end compared to what we were monitoring uh, or reporting at the end of the third quarter. Um, and that has allowed a surplus of just over £2 million pounds, um, for us to distribute. Um, we proposed and agreed that that would be moved into reserves, um, primarily to establish a new reserve to offset edu uh, education deficits in 24-5 on a provisional basis, whilst um, uh, the council continues to work with schools on establishing a coordinated approach to, to tap in um, the deficits that they're facing. It's a small balance of 80k and that's gone into uh, the general fund. The HRA um, had a slightly reduced projected drawdown on the, on the ring fence reserve and um, so that's now down at three point well three and a half million pounds. Uh, the level of reserve is is reasonable and that's um, in the context of pressures in the service in 24-5. Obviously, we'll, we'll review that in preparation for the next round of the business plan. Uh, level of usable reserves, um, notwithstanding the comments I was making at the opening, they've reduced in year um, by a little bit less than being projected, uh, but some of those commitments exist um, with slippages um, due to capital, uh, slippages in capital expenditure. And uh, just to finish, um, we've, um, and this is almost a continuous piece of work for us now, um, we undertook a further uh, reserve reallocation exercise in year towards the end of the financial year. Um, and that was built into 2024-5 budget proposals, and that's reflected in this outturn position too. Um, and that includes refreshing the social services reserves, um, given the demands placed on them in 23-4, as well as setting aside that reserve for potential overall deficit on school balances. Um, so that's all I was going to say, introduction, and um, happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, good news to see that um, schools um, overall um, are in a surplus. As you said, others are not so lucky as us, so that's really, really positive news. Um, and I note that you've said that council staff are working in a coordinated way with, with schools to tackle um, and minimise deficits for this year. Um, what exactly are they doing in a coordinated way? Do, do, do you have any more information on that? Thank you. I think we've lost Matt for a moment, but we've got Gemma. Gemma, please, if you if you could come in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in terms of um, some of the um, streams of work that were undertaken with schools, so there was um, a, a task force that was established to work with schools um, and identify um, some emerging themes around um, things that we could address from a, a budgetary perspective. Um, and that's an overarching piece of work and it's looking specifically at contract spend and agency spend. Um, the team within education finance and the management team within education are meeting with schools on an individual basis as well and they will be um, going through budgets um, on a line by line basis and looking at um, um, curriculum planning, um, management teams. Um, they'll also be doing some some benchmarking and offer um, and working with other schools to offer kind of peer support and review of um, budget setting as well. Thank, thank you, Gemma. That's um, that's really interesting and and. And of course, you know, you, you've mentioned um, the, the contracts and agency spend. 
um, one of the things that that you know I'm, I'm quite passionate about is is a more strategic approach to procurement for, for this authority. Um, and if there was an opportunity for us to consider um, a dedicated procurement specialist for schools, I am absolutely positive that that would provide dividends for you to, to be able to, you know, analyse the spend, put in place some agreements for, for schools, because there will be considerable savings to be to be had from that. Um, not sure if that is something that they're also looking at within the kind of like aligning contracts and budgets, but it really would definitely, definitely help. Um, Councillor Lovelock Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, following on from that, I, I have a question with regards to scrutiny of um, the school budgets. And if they're taken into consideration, I, I just want to focus on the 19 primary schools that are listed as, as having a deficit. Um, what what assessment has been undertaken to ensure that the governing bodies uh, and gov governors, of which I, 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 I declare I am one, um, are given sort of um, further support and guidance to ensure that we're all fulfilling our roles in terms of the financial scrutiny of school budgets uh, sort of our, our, on a more robust basis so that uh, in particular we can um, highlight uh, or we can be more aware um, of any projected shortfalls uh, and put into place perhaps more proactive, as Councillor Prother has said, um, sort of strategies for, for ensuring that um, we're not in a similar position or we're certainly learning lessons um, from, from where, where we've been these past um, sort of uh, this past year. Thank you. And Matt, you're back in the room. Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> Thank and, and you. apologies. Um, I was ready to come in earlier. I, I didn't press my button, sorry. Um, oh. But actually, Gemma, Gemma did a, a better job than I would have put. She did an excellent job. Question, okay. excellent and, I, job. And, and I might uh, need her to come in now because we're we're obviously very close to the work with uh, that Trevor has been doing with the schools um, budget forum and the and the task group and the work that Gemma outlined. And also the, the education finance team and Trevor are working very closely um, with the head teachers. Um, the bit that um, I can't pick up from um, your question, uh, Councillor Lovelock Edwards, is how that then transfers onto the, the relationships with, with the governing bodies and what sort of conversations have been happening there. So I'm not sure if Gemma can come in and help on that. Um, I, I, I certainly know, thanks Matt, I certainly know that the, um, we're reviewing the kind of training that governors review and uh, receive and um, the kind of financial training and um, perhaps in the context of some of these emerging challenges. But I think um, I'm not aware of any specific work streams apart from that kind of individual school review that's been t undertaken with, with governors outside of that. Um, and I think it's a really interesting point that's been raised. And, and uh, you know, I'd be happy to kind of have some conversations with my colleagues in, in education about whether there's any potential to build on that um, challenge and scrutiny at, at governor level, because I think that could be um, really helpful um, to the process. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matt and Gemma. Um, Councillor Carroll, would you like to come in, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. And I, too, declare an interest as a governor of Landock Primary School. Um, to further the point that um, has been discussed so far, I would just emphasise that from our own discussions that we've had as a governing body, there are significant budgetary pressures that are being faced, and I don't think we should be as a committee glossing over that. I mean, I appreciate the point that's been made about the budget overall facing a surplus. But I do think that the extra support that has been mooted would be very beneficial because, as I've said from an experience, the comments that we've received as a governing body are one of ones of concern and 
I think it's important that that is pushed. And as I said, I declare an interest, and I will. Um, I'd be grateful if that could be um, could be registered, please. Thank, you. thank you, Councillor Carroll. Um, and yes, uh, you know, overall to be in a surplus is a very healthy position. But as you said, you know there there are a number of schools, well, quite a few schools that are still in you know difficulty. So any support that we can give, certainly with with um, possible more training for for the governors on scrutiny, that would be good. But also, as I said, you know, a strategic procurement function would really really help. Um, Councillor Johnson. Would you like to come in? Would, would Karen like to come in first? She's got a hand raised. Presumably that's a, a matter that she uh, wants to speak on. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, Chair, I was only going to say that with regard to the um, comments that Gemma made, could, yeah. if she does get any information, could she? are you happy for us to email it to all members of the committee um, you know, if we do get any information from the head of service, Trevor Baker. And the other um, point I wanted to raise in relation to Councillor Carroll's declaration, yeah. we're not talking specifically about the schools no. um, that he is a governor of, but so he is able to speak and vote on this matter unless it was specifically on a school that he was involved in. But I will record the fact that they have, both of them, Councillor Lovelock Edwards and Councillor Carroll, have said that they are governors in the minutes. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Councillor Johnson, please come in now. Uh, Thank you very much. We have now spoken quite a bit about schools, of course, naturally, because of the situation. I'd like to make a general point about last year's accounts. I think it's difficult for me to understand how much of the overspend, the 34 million, how much of this was planned in advance and how much happened as a result of increasing pressures on the budget. I don't know if this year in future this can be made more clear to us as councillors so that we can identify how much of the spending, for example, the spent expenditure coming from the housing revenue account, all the money being the capital spending, this has been planned in advance to be spent in year, and I think we should treat this differently to the money where there's been an overspend because of budgetary pressures and place them separately for us to be able to understand them. One is obviously planned and one is unplanned. It's worth taking into consideration. As the council has done with the reserves for schools in the new year, So for us to realise that the money that we earmarked wasn't actually sufficient for the significant pressures that we have. Having said that, coming back to the point about schools, I agree with the Chair. If there is no procurement expertise in, in relation to education within the council we should consider how we fill that gap because it's impossible because it's possible that there are savings which could be made i'm a former governor and i'm not sure to which extent finance committees within school governing bodies to which extent they are trained I take it, but obviously there are further conversations to consider the challenges being faced by schools. What's odd, looking at Appendix 3 in the papers, you can see schools on, uh, figures on a school-by-school -school basis across the county, and it's clear that there are a number of significant deficits 
in the primaries and the reserves that a number of schools have are in the comprehensives. So this raises questions in terms of how this situation has come about. Obviously, the situation, generally speaking, has deteriorated since the end of COVID two years ago, but obviously when Matt talks about across the sector, there's a surplus. The majority of that money sits with comprehensives. So why is there such a discrepancy between the two sectors, comprehensives and primaries? Is there a rationale for this? And how do we set about resolving this? Why is there this discrepancy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, you. I, um... I missed the first part of um, what Councillor Johnson said, and I was a bit late um, changing my settings. So if I miss anything, Please just repeat the the, last, the first bit. But I think there's three things to uh, to pick up. One is around um, uh, Councillor Johnson supporting um, the chair's comments around having specialist procurement provision support in schools, um, and we'll pick that up with with Trevor and the task group that he's operating. Um, and then on the um, the planned unplanned use of reserves um we note your comments um we've been attempting to present that um and we'll, we'll look into a bit more detail about where we've not been doing it but um i've been keen that we we're very clear about where we've been using reserves because we plan to do so and, and where we we haven't um and then on the um the question of the, the difference um or the contrast between uh, primary and secondary schools and where the, the majority of the, the deficits are. Um, I don't have an answer for you, but that is something um, that the, the Schools Budget Forum and the, um, and the task group are aware of. Um, and we'll possibly have something further to say about that later in the year if there, if there is more work done around trying to understand why that, why that is the case. I'm not sure if um, colleagues want to um, add and come into what, what I've said or, or whether Councillor Johnson, whether there was anything I missed from your opening remarks and apologies for that. Thank you, Matt. Would we be able to have that report um, when Travis had a had a really good look at why there is that discrepancy between the primaries and the and the comprehensives as well? Because I think that would be an interesting report. I think he's not been he's not actually as putting a report together as such, but we are oh. aware of, of that discrepancy. Okay. Councillor Johnson, was there anything that was missed from that, please? Uh, I think that was the answer, the points I raised. In, yeah. in that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Franks, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, like other colleagues, I'm a school governor, uh, but I'm grateful that Carol has clarified that... Uh, uh, it's okay for me to speak. Um, I fully endorse the chair's uh, suggestion of uh, additional support uh, to school governors uh, regarding procurement and no doubt other matters. Uh, that's very useful. Uh, I'm sure we're all well aware of the huge um, challenges facing uh, schools these days um, and uh, expert advice would be welcome. Um, however, I don't think that should disguise the uh, fact that uh, so many schools are underfunded. Um, I'm trying to speak and look at the, uh, uh, the report at the same time. And when it comes to school balances, um, it's all very well uh, having a global uh, balance uh, for primaries, global balance for secondary schools. Um, but that doesn't really help uh, individual schools that uh, are, are struggling to finance. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, an, an average or a percentage is um, is an inappropriate measure uh, for schools that are simply running out of uh, uh, of, of money. Um, I think I need to uh, study these details more, and uh, hopefully we'll get advice from um, the education department on the differences between primary and secondary. But it's quite stark, isn't it? Uh, but it does tell me, although it says 33% um, of secondary schools are in deficit, uh, really you have to add the other one, the, 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 the 3 to 19. So uh, it's, it's heading up to 50% of um, secondary schools that are in financial difficulties. So I think it's a question... Quite simply, we're underfunding our schools, we're underfunding education, and although, yes, we should be offering uh, additional uh, financial um, expertise, I think really what we should be offering is extra finances. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Franks. Um, not so much of a question there, really, more of a statement, um, I guess. Um, but Matt, um, maybe we could look at it from a slightly different aspect. How, how, if you've got time to tell us, how are the budgets for schools set? What, what actually are the formulas that they use to set the budgets? Thank you. I might, I might need Gemma to help me out here. The the current um, schools formula has been in place for for a number of years, I, I believe, and obviously the, the majority of the money is allocated through age weighted pupil units. So the the number of uh, pupils in the school is is the main driver. Um, I'm not sure if there are any plans to review the formula um, further, um, but that that. Doubtless is, is going to be one of the considerations. Um, as as Councillor Frank said, um, we are concerned about the amount of funding we, we have for schools as, as a council. Um, and we do, and colleagues will recall, as part of the 23-4 budget setting, um, that we put significantly more resources into education than, than that actually flowed through to us from Welsh Government as well. So there's an overall funding um, challenge. And then there's uh, the question about how we allocate resources across the sectors as a, as a local authority. Um, hi, just, just to come in briefly, but I do have um, a couple of slides, Chair, on um, how the um, school's formula is, is allocated that I can share um, with members if that's helpful. And I think the current formula has been in place um, coming up to 10 years. So um, it's been in place for a while and it was designed with Budget Forum um, intended so that it was, you know, understood by by the by the heads, um, and and slightly more accessible than I think some of the models elsewhere, um, in other local authorities. I mean, essentially, it is a model of apportioning funding, so it, it can be quite crude, and there can be um, people who gain and, and people who lose out as a result of that. But Matt's absolutely right; the majority of the drivers around pupil numbers. Then there are a number of fixed items um, within the formula that also um, drives funding. Um, so lim there's also linkages to the, the cleaned floor area of the school, for instance, um, and items linked to um, the, the size of the, the management team, etc. cetera. Um, but as I say, Chair, I've got a couple of slides and I'll circulate those to um, members um, following this committee. Thank you, thank you, Gemma. So maybe we have a have an answer in exactly what you've just told us, that it's to do with pupil numbers, size of schools, size of management teams, that a primary school would, would struggle more than a comprehensive school. Um, but, you know, maybe there's no science behind this at all. OK, um, thank you. So so we'll, we'll gratefully receive those slides just so that we can uh, have a bit more information. Uh, do we have any any other questions on this particular? Well, agenda item three and four. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, dear. Us, us doing... If I may, I would just like to ask, as is typical, 
there is an overspend because of increasing pressures in social services for adults and children looked after as well. As these are ongoing pressures and something that we see year after year, what is the situation in relation to grants or additional funding from Welsh Government to deal with this? Can we address this problem or do we just face it and expect um, it to deteriorate? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Matt, do we have an answer or do we need to talk to social services about additional... Well, probably a statement, really, a, a, yeah. against that. Um, we, we have to manage those pressures against the overall level of resources we have. We do have um, specific grants from Welsh Government across a, a number of our, our services, um, but the number of this is, is down to the overall level of resources that the the council has to deliver all its services. Um, we'll see when we get on to the the, the quarter one monitoring um, that the position we were re reflecting on in in the outturn uh, persists going forward. Um, areas such as children's social care, in particular, with with relatively small cohorts and um, some volatility, really difficult um, to forecast um, uh, accurately for. Um, and also trends in, in adults and social care difficult as well. And you, know, you throw in uh, on top of that, not just the, the volume changes, but the cost um, increases that we've seen. So um, not difficult, to, not easy to budget for. Um, we're trying to make sure that we put enough resource in those areas. Um, but in the context of the overall funding that we have as a council, it is, it's a real challenge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, points, us, Gathlin. If I may, Jay, a point in relation to the pressures faced for social care for adults and for children. These are things which do not just relate to this council, they are national. So how much, what kinds of pressure can we place on Welsh Government for, to, for them to act on these increasing pressures because it's possible perhaps to look at the linked um, flow in terms of older people and adults services but as Matt said the volatility around the number of children and the complexity as they come into care can change the budget entirely with one or two being added or being released from the support and as this is national in nature obviously we need to deal with the situation we face but Welsh Government has a responsibility to help us I would argue And the, the, um, as a council, we, we do a, a range of lobbying, um, certainly through um, support of Welsh Local Government Association and the Society of Welsh Treasurers. We, we undertake um, a cost pressure survey autumn each year. Um, that's always shared with Welsh Government. Um, and in, in effect, that's lobbying for extra resources um, for the social care pressures and the schools pressures that, that we're experiencing. Um, and I do know that the, the leader as well, um, through her conversations with, with Welsh Government is um, not only pushing for a better share of the overall funding from um, Welsh Government for the bail, uh, but also for the, the, the total quantum that the Welsh Government is allocating as well. And it's that has to be a, a, a continuous activity for us as a council, doesn't it? Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, it's a very tricky, tricky one, this one. And as uh, Councillor Johnson has said, um, any support from above 
is going to is going to assist all our local authorities with the with with what is really crisis management in social services these days, isn't it? It's really really difficult. Um, anybody else with any other questions on agenda item three and four? No. Okay, that's um, that's brilliant. So um, the recommendations were um, for both of these items um, that came from cabinet and and uh, and also the um, report from. Uh, Director of the Corporate Resources, um, was that we note, so we note the report um, and within it the allocation of the surplus 20 million which has been transferred to the new reserves to offset the school's deficit on a provisional basis for 24-25 and also that 80,000 uh, to council fund to offset the general pressure to be noted. Um, there have been a couple of suggestions and some comments, so Karen, if they can, they can also be noted and uh, return to cabinet so they can see see what our thoughts are on this particular question but um if we are happy with that if we can move please to the next gender item i'd be grateful for a hand thank you councillor good john and thank you councillor hamilton that's great um if we now then move to agenda item five this is another reference that came from cabinet on the 18th of july which seems quite a long time ago now but um it's the capital closure of accounts 2324 um, and it's back to Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so this is the second of the, the outturn reports. Um, this outlines the outturn of the 2324 capital programme by directorate and also details the funding sources uh, used to fund the programme. Um, there were several schemes um, that totaled £5.4 million uh, requiring to be added late into the programme um, and the report notes uh, that the, the final adjusted programme for 23-4 was £104 million, £103,892 um, and that capital expenditure during the year was £88.62 million. Um, despite capital schemes facing continued challenges during the, you know, due to a number of issues, including cost pressures, shortage of resources. I think it is uh, quite encouraging, pleasing to note um, that the outturn was uh, uh, £88.6 million, pounds, um, which was 85% of the programme. Um, there's been, and I know we've had a lot of focus on delivery of the capital programme in these scrutiny meetings, there's been a lot of uh, genuine real focus, commitment and hard work across the directorates to deliver um, that adjusted um, programme. Uh, nevertheless, there is some slippage and £15 million pounds of um, spend against schemes which we've um, taken forward now into the 24-25 um, capital programme. Um, as you'll see from the papers, uh, the summary of the, all those changes in the capital programme, director to director from approval at the council, all the way back at 6th of March 2022-3 uh, to date, um, are set out in a appendix two. So there's a really good trail of the changes that we've made uh, to the programme during the year. Um, there's a breakdown of the funding um, in the body of the report. Um, Relatively in, insignificant amount is the um, supported borrowing allocation from Welsh Government. That was uh, £1.327 million. Pounds. Um, that's been spent uh, during the year. In some instances where schemes were originally planned to be financed from, from that funding source, they may have underspent. Um, and as a consequence, other schemes planned to be funded from capital receipts, revenue contributions, etc., they've been substituted in their place so that we, we make sure that we've um, spent up against that uh, allocation. Then um, furthermore, um, significant streams were used the total of £43 million pounds in the form of specific Welsh Government grant, other grant income and Section 106. Um, and additionally, and this links in with the, the previous report on your agenda this evening, uh, just short of £30 million pounds has been drawn down from um, reserves or funded through um, revenue contribution to capital and significant amount of that for our housing revenue account. Uh, relatively small capital receipts, just over a million pounds received in 23-4, um, and that leaves us a balance of capital receipts of £7.7 .7 million. Pounds. I think the position we wanted to get onto is actually um, 
talking about the the schemes that have been successfully delivered and I think over the last year we've we've moved away a bit from these conversations being um, dominated by discussions around slippage um, and this you know there is a lot to be celebrated in terms of what's been delivered through the capital program um, last year um, significant spend under learning and skills um, you know major spend of that 12 million of that was on sustainable communities for learning program that's been really successful um, and current spend includes uh, completion of Ascol St. Barrack, four and a half million pounds, and also uh, significant works at St. Nicholas, 4.2 million pounds. Um, there are also 11 schemes totaling um, two million pounds for the Community Focus School grant scheme. Um, and we've pulled out an example of that in, in the report with the, the Romilly Primary in relation to the sports barn. Uh, to provide new interior updated entrance, etc. Uh, the remaining of this learning and skills money is on uh, maintenance, and that includes schemes such as toilet refurbishment, rewiring, roof repair, so um, maintaining the school estate the best we can. Uh, and the social services, um, there is the um, electric bikes um, scheme that we've talked about that was funded through UK uh, Shared Prosperity. Uh, providing electric bikes to domiciliary carers uh, throughout the Vale over the last 12 months um, and a number have been made um, available across the eastern and uh, western uh, Vale area. Housing Improvement Programme um, has been uh, working very effectively um, and the report sets out the um, Hayeswood Road development in particular where the council stepped in to manage that uh, development um, and it's very heartening to know that the first 14 of the 53 planned homes were handed over back in, in February. Um, there are also a wide range of schemes in environment and housing, um, they include highways improvement, active travel, fleet replacement, um, which were all broadly delivered on time. There is some slippage in there uh, again this year predominantly around um, the fleet um, program, and that's uh, primarily due to um, delivery of vehicles with a number of them uh, being delivered post 31st of March, and that, that sort of arbitrary cutoff we have in our, our financial world. So that's just a couple of words of introduction on the capital program, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, and and yes, in um, in in the real world, which of course is where we're building buildings and spending money, um, to to have managed to get to nearly eighty six percent of money spent is actually quite quite an achievement. Um, when it comes to 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 that fifteen million of slippage, um, and I know you've mentioned fleet. Are there any other particular projects that have um, that have halted and 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 their reasons for them or delayed shall we say thank you they they are all um highlighted in the appendices and um i've not planned to draw particular attention to any of those except the ones i've, I've just mentioned really Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, do we have any other questions? Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Over to you. Uh, just and um, um, just really quickly, there's a program which is agreed, and then there are additions, and then it's amended or revised i just wanted to note or make a note of how long ago the plan was or the program was after it was revised when was this agreed when in the financial year do we revise the original figures i take it that the 15 million which is available is funding which will be spent over the next year 
And as Matt mentioned, about the five million coming in late. At the end of the financial year is just one date. And things have been spent in April and May and so forth on these projects. Is there anything which won't be taken forward? Thank you. I'll I'll need to come. I'll need to come back on on that question. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, if you could, that would be that would be really helpful. Do we have any other questions, everybody? No, no more questions on this particular agenda item. Okay, that's great. So um, the recommendations were simply that committee considers and reviews the end of your position on this particular matter, which we've done. So if we can have a hand to move, then I'll uh, move to the next agenda item. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Councillor Goodjohn. Okay. Right then, so we're on agenda item six. Um, this is a reference from Cabinet on the 18th of July. This is the annual Treasury Management Report for 23-24. Um, again, a historical report, and we've got Matt Baumer here again, I think, to take us through. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a, a fairly highly regulated area, as we um, often tell you. Um, we require for regulations uh, issued under the Local Government Act 2003 to produce an, an annual uh, Treasury Management Review of Activities and to actually report on the year-end position on our prudential and uh, Treasury indicators. So there is a fair amount of, of content in this uh, paper in front of you. Uh, it does, the report also meets the requirements of a couple of codes of practice. So that's the set for code of practice on treasury management uh, and the set for code, uh, the set for prudential code for capital finance and local authorities, and also um, Welsh Government guidance on uh, local government in investments. So, as I say, fairly heavily uh, regulated area. Uh, the report, um, which is the positive bit, the report uh, demonstrates compliance with all our potential indicators and treasury limits set out in the treasury investment strategy um, that was approved by council back in um, March 2023 at the start of the financial year. Um, and they, those indicators uh, and limits are designed to ensure that um, all our local authority borrowing is prudent, sustainable and important. So that is and affordable rather than that is all uh, really important stuff. Um, we do undertake, um, as you all know, uh, capital expenditure on long term assets. And these activities are either financed, funded immediately um, through capital revenue resources. This ties in with our previous two reports, isn't it, uh, through capital receipts, grants, etc., or give rise to borrowing. Um, and that need um, for borrowing is, is termed capital financing requirement. Uh, so during 23-4, um, the council, and you're hopefully familiar with this as well, we've maintained an underborrowed position, and that's um, contributed to some of that upside in revenue at the end of the year. This has meant that the borrowing need, the capital financing requirement, wasn't fully funded with external loan debt. So we didn't go out and borrow for that, uh, but instead cash supporting the council's reserves, balances and cash flow itself were used as an interim measure. And that's something that we're continually monitoring and, and managing as a team. Um, we did... Um, undertake some external borrowing um, during the year, and that was £5 million over a five-year period for the PWRB from Public Works Loan Board to finance capital expenditure for the housing revenue account. Um, and colleagues will possibly recall that um, we do have a preferential rate uh, when we borrow um, for the HRA, um, and that's uh, 60 by basis points or 0.6 of a percent less than the, the standard interest rate that the PWLB would, would charge us. Um, we didn't uh, re-borrow for any 
um, maturing debt that was all financed um, from revenue and positive cash flow. Um, so as a consequence of all of that, uh, the council's borrowing requirement um, only increased marginally during the year, so um, by £3.1 million, pounds, or 3.2 um, rounded up, um, making our capital financing requirement £198.8 um, million pounds at the 31st of March 2024. And at that same day, debt, um, we held £143 million pounds of external borrowing, and therefore we've borrow underborrowed by uh, just over £55 million. Pounds. The, um, the council's debt portfolio uh, with interest rates payable is listed in, in the report, and it also shows the movement of the portfolio from um, year-end 2023 to the year-end uh, 2024. So that's just a bit about on borrowing, on investing. Um, again, you'll recall some of this. Uh, council has a cautious approach to risk, and the priority is very much to safeguard capital. And um, we manage our investments in-house investing only uh, with those institutions which meet the minimum credit rating criteria, and they're included on the approved lending list laid out in our investment strategy. Uh, we use a variety of investment uh, tools that are listed in the report, um, and they're set out with the yield and return for each category of investment. Um, the portfolio is uh, predominantly made up of instant access and fixed term deposits up to 364 days, so just short of a year. Um, and again, uh, the table in the report shows, shows the movement. Uh, total investments at the 31st of March were £34.2 uh, million. Pounds. Um, due to, and again, this links in with some of the comments I made about the revenue report, due to uh, stubborn inflation pressure, global instability, uh, UK interest rates have continued to be volatile. Um, so the uh, upward slope in yield curve has prevailed throughout um, the whole of the financial year, which has meant the councils uh, continually faced with the challenge of proactive investment of surplus cash has emphasised the need for detailed working knowledge of, of cash flow projections. Um, and again, the, the team um, hold really detailed knowledge on, on our cash flows and work with that on a, uh, a daily basis. Um, and finally, on this one, just as a, a result of the higher investment returns, um, throughout 23-4, uh, the financing costs, the proportion of our net stream of, for both council tax and housing rents, uh, are actually below the level we originally budgeted for, which is good news to end on introducing this report. Um, so that's all I've got to say, introducing this one. And, and again, um, very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Matt. Yes, um, Treasury management is, as you said, highly regulated. Um, and there's a lot of technical speak and terminology. So. Um, for my own benefit and also anyone that's listening i think the the term underborrowed is quite a quite a an interesting one um understand that this is money that we didn't need to, to, to have additional loans on um but what what exactly is the advantage to us as an authority of underborrowing exactly so if that's the, okay yeah the simple benefit is um there's a couple of benefits um Certainly, um, the the cost of sending that money out for investment um, it's more expensive to borrow um, compared to the the money that you're not gaining from having a higher investment um, sum of money uh, at uh, to hand, and also um, it does um, reduce your borrowing risk on your investments. You've you've got less money out with with third parties and some of the risk that. That yeah. might have, albeit that we, as I've just said, we are very, very cautious in who we lend out to in any case. Hmm. Thank you. Um, another two very quick generic questions, because um, I would like to know, um, how do how do we actually set an authorised limit? How is it set? And how how are operational boundaries calculated as well? Easy questions, I, I hope. Yeah, I might ask Gemma to come in in a moment because <laughs> the tweet. 
they're generally set around uh, affordability um, right. and also with, with an eye to our future capital commitments as well. So that's a quite high level um, re response. I don't know if Gemma wants to come in with a bit more, more detail on that. Um, ha happy to come in. I'll try not to go on too much because and, and bore people, but the operational boundary is considered to be um, a limit you'd set, expected not to exceed it in terms of borrowing, but um, you could exceed it on a temporary basis for operational purposes. And when setting that, we think about um, how much capital financing requirement we need to borrow, but also what our kind of cash flows tend to be in a month. So we think about what our kind of payroll and um, accounts payable outgoings are in month and we 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 build that on so we think about what the the likely call would be on our borrowing our authorized limit is is the level that you would never want to exceed um and obviously it 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 does happen um but we'd have to bring a report um straight away um to committees to advise them that we'd breached our authorized limit and um we needed to revise it and and explain why that had happened um so we tend to give ourselves quite a lot of headroom there in terms of setting it so so we always set that a little bit higher and i suppose we think about um, slightly more extreme circumstances within a month that would would influence how we set that authorised limit um, for our treasury management purposes. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, anybody else got any questions? Councillor Johnson. Uh, Dio, uh, my, my, my... Thank you. Got a number of questions in terms of how the money has moved across the year. If I can refer to table seven, table seven and eight, and then to paragraph two point two three, there's a mention of a new debt. The board for public services five million additional for five years just trying to understand table seven and eight in terms of the total of debt that we hold because this is going down by some five million over the year and then I'd like to understand the quite significant difference or substantial difference between the investments that the council has in table 10 I think which are going down throughout the year from 94 million pounds to 34 million pounds I'd just like to get a little bit more of an explanation if it could be unpacked, those movements. And just out of interest, there's a mention about a concessionary loan of around a half a million, which has just come to an end in August of this year. I just wanted to ask to what that was referring. Is that clear enough as questions? Thank you, Matt. I might need you to come back and answer the second and third ones again. So the, the first one, so I'm, I'm getting a bit of echo to deal with it. The, the, the first one, obviously, we're paying to have debt and it's maturing. Um, and that the, the intro, um, some of the material we have been borrowing for, but then we've had a requirement against the HRA, which was five million pounds that we've borrowed. And uh, just for five years, I think my expectation is that. Sorry, that Chair, can, can you all hear? Because I can't hear some of what Matt is saying. Is there a problem for anybody else? 
uh, I'm having a challenge with that as well. Sorry, he, he yeah. was coming in and yeah. out, Karen. Yeah. 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 Can you try again, Matt? We don't know what the, the audio issue is. Your end. Yeah, that's gone. No, it hasn't gone. The can, if I'm, I'm not, I'm switching. I, th I think the, the first question um, related to something from my opening remarks on the um, on the report. We obviously have um, two things happening on on the borrowing front. We've got an underlying need to to borrow um, further money uh, because of the the needs of the capital program, but we also have um, debt maturing, um, which uh, we potentially would re borrow for. Uh, but what we haven't done um, this year, we've, we've borrowed the five million pounds to support the HRA, but debt that's maturing, we've we've not um, reborrowed for that. We've we've met that through um, our our general cash balances. So I'm not sure if that answers your your first question, Councillor Johnson. Um, yes, that that's fine. That thanks. Um, would you mind repeating your second one? Sorry. Uh, oh, it's either I'll question and the second question related to the investments, and then what is the concessionary loan? That was the third, the last one. So on on the investments, um, and this will be a. a feature in, in the current financial year as well. Um, there's two things that are driving the overall levels of investment at year end. One is um, the total value of the, the reserves and balances that we have as, as a council. Um, and as those um, decline, which we've seen, then the overall uh, funds available for investment will, will decline. But also, this is a, a feature of where we are at year end and the, the sort of 31st of March line in the sand. And there will be cash flows um, that vary across that line from one year to the next. So we, we will always expect to see some volatility in, in the level of investments at that 31st of March point. And could you just point me to where the, the concessionary loan issue was as well, please? Uh, I just wanted an explanation of what it what it was, seeing as it's just uh, just come to an end. It's half a million pounds within the table. I'm not entirely sure. I might ask um, if Gemma knows, and if Gemma doesn't know, then, then we'll do you a, um, we'll email you after the meeting. Um, hi, um, good evening. So in terms of the concessionary loan, this is um, a, a loan that we've had from from Welsh Government. Um, so we call it a concessionary loan because it's an interest free loan. It was due for um, repayment, um, but we have just had the period of the loan um, extended um, until next financial year. Um, and the loan was um, associated with the regeneration scheme. Thank you, Gemma. Um, do we have any other questions on this particular agenda item? No? Okay, let's, um, let's move switch swiftly on to the recommendations then, which, which were simply that we considered and we reviewed the full report. Um, which we have done. So can I have a hand to move and we'll go on to the next agenda item. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. And seconder. Thank you, Councillor Hanks. Brilliant. OK, let's move on then to agenda item seven. Um, we now on the reports of the Director of Corporate Resources. These are um, reports from now. So this is quarter one, revenue monitoring 24-25. And I think, Gemma, you're going to take us through this one. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. You Good are. evening. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so in terms of um, quarter one revenue monitoring, um, 
I will, of course, you'll expect me to say it's very early in the financial year, um, but these are very much repeating some of the themes that you'll have heard in the outturn report. And we'll again be talking about when we start to talk about the budget strategy as well. So real kind of um, national um, trends as well in terms of local government pressures. Um, and members will recall that um, in setting the 24-25 budget, we had a significant shortfall and um, some of the difficult um, decisions that were made were quite a challenging savings target of 7.676 million. Um, and um, you, you'll see within the report that progress against that savings target has been um, mixed um, and to some extent um, understandable given the kind of late um, allocation of those savings targets to, to service areas and, and the complex nature of some of those um, savings proposals. So there has been some lag on implementation of those savings proposals. But in addition to that, um, a number of the cost pressures that were put forward by service departments were um, revised down. So a number of the cost pressures were allocated at 75% of the level um, that they were indicated would be the, the total level of pressure for 24-25. Um, and so we are seeing that um, the, that 75% award wasn't sufficient in some areas. So I'll just quickly run through some of the key headlines within the report. But again, I'll be happy to take any, any pressures on the report. Um, so um, there are significant pressures across schools, additional learning needs, children's and young people services and adult social services. We're also seeing pressures around homelessness, but there is quite significant um, Welsh Government grant that seems to be um, supporting that pressure in year. Um, but we're also seeing continuation of, of global pressures around pay and inflationary pressures. Um, some of those pressures within um, children's and young people services, within adults and additional learning needs, aren't just due to an increase in, in incidence, but it's also around complexity of need as well. Um, schools are um, continuing to work to set balanced budgets. Um, historically, we've seen that the initial deficits reported by schools have have reduced as, as we've been working with schools to try and bring them down. So the monitoring report at quarter one reflects an estimate of where we think schools might end up at year end. Um, but we will um, continue to, to work with schools and, and we should get slightly more realistic position as part of the quarter two monitoring. Um, as I mentioned, the homelessness pressures have been mitigated in year because we've had some additional Welsh Government grant. So the planned drawdown from reserve um, from the Housing and Homelessness Reserve will be reduced and that's reflected within um, Appendix 1 in the monitoring. Um, and that's quite good news because we know that there will be um, a lag in terms of the smoothing that we were hoping to do around the homelessness pressure because um, whilst the rapid rehousing um, programme is starting to take effect and we are seeing um, potential um, moves out of um, the hotel accommodation, for instance, um, we don't think that that will be um, in line with the smoothing that was set out as part of the 24, 25 um, and medium term financial plan. Um, in terms of um, generally, I think obviously it's been some years since we've set a kind of general inflationary pressure and we are seeing some of that um, impact across services as well. Um, but delays on implementation of savings is also taking an impact. Act. Um, and we did allocate a million pounds for budget risk as part of the 24-25 budget setting. Um, and that has um, had an initial allocation as part of this report to mitigate those pressures to a certain extent. Um, in terms of progress against savings targets, we are reporting 76% um, um, achieved or mitigated in year. Um, but there are some significant savings that we're continuing to work towards implementing. Um, obviously, within the report, there is a significant drawdown in an unplanned manner from reserves. Um, and um, that's approaching 14 million when we take into account schools um, drawdown from reserves. And, and obviously, as, as Councillor Johnson um, picked up in, in the previous um, revenue outturn report, that will be a mix of planned use of schools reserves and unplanned use of um, reserves. 
the council has a number of work streams that it's progressing to try and get mitigate that unplanned use of reserves in year because those service reserves will be really um, vital as we um, go forward. So um, one of those is the school's budget task force, which we um, discussed as part of the outturn report. And there are some particular work streams around contracts and agency spend and some additional information that I'll try and get from the service and circulate to members. Um, some additional resources being put in place to try and accelerate the delivery of savings and transformational proposals as part of the um, reshaping services program. There are also some controls that have been introduced around new recruitment and non-essential spend. Um, and it goes without saying that directors are working with service accountants to manage the unplanned drawdown of service reserves as much as possible. And um, we'll also be reviewing the use of grant expenditure. Um, that should say grant income, of course, apologies. Um, in terms of reserves, we are expecting a significant reduction on reserves. So we're expecting reserves to reduce to um, 50.6 million um, at the end of this financial year. Happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, Gemma. Appreciate this is um, quarter one. Um, again, this is just, just quite a, gen a generic question for me, um, but I am quite curious. So, so why did why is it that we have only now and in the past for the last few years only allocated very limited contractual inflation um, when we consider the, the the budget? Because it's something that that is an issue and it has caused us cost pressures this year and last year. So, so why is it that we take that approach? Thank you. Um. I think I think you know we have allocated specific contractual um, inflationary pressures. So we've we have looked at some um, cost pressures around, for instance, school transport, um, and particularly in the social services sector around placements. But but other than that, you're absolutely right. We haven't allocated um, general inflationary pressure, and I think. Um, there is some, some impact around that. So um, an example um, within the monitoring is some pressures in um, residential homes. And obviously they're um, particularly exposed to those um, global inflationary pressures um, in a similar way to probably schools are. Um, and I think what the um, attempt has been is to try and create some... Um, some additional um, kind of inbuilt pressure and savings within the system. Obviously, the, the level of pressures that we are reporting is already unaffordable. So it's been a way to try and manage those pressures down. Um, but I think we're, we'll certainly be looking to take a slightly different approach for um, the budget strategy that will be coming forward um, in November. Thank you. That's um, that's really good to hear. Um, Councillor Lovelock edwards Thanks, Chair. Um, following on from your question, I, I just wanted to ask, I appreciate we're still in sort of um, monitoring period one, but um, how, uh, is the approach that we're taking um, any different from other local authorities? Um, uh, are we aware of how other local authorities may be better placed than us um, at this moment in time that we can learn lessons from or to link up to to see how they are doing it, uh, doing things. And I, I know that's a bit generic, but following on from Councillor Prothero's uh, sort of uh, question and your response, Jim, I'm just keen to know about how we can keep learning um, and sort of tapping into sort of good practice elsewhere so we can adapt and change. Yes, absolutely. And that's a really, a really good point. So um, obviously we, we share information um, quite informally when we meet. We, we kind of always want to talk um, with our kind of counterparts around um, some of the pressures they're experiencing. Um, we have a kind of treasurer's group um, and um, a chief accountants group. And so we've been sharing some information um, at those groups around the, the pressures that we're all reporting, but also some of our kind of budgetary assumptions as well. Um, built into our um, budget strategy as well, we're, we're hoping to put more emphasis on, on benchmarking as well, um, so we can can look um, in more detail at the cost of services um, to inform some of our um, potential savings proposals and 
and a review of, you know, kind of good practice and, and good ideas that are coming forward. Um, so I know we do um, lots of comparisons in the um, social services space around kind of provider fees and things like that. Um, and, and we're doing starting to do some comparisons um, elsewhere as well. Chair, may I just follow up on that? Um, it, it's in terms of commun community engagement. Uh, and I know that this is a really complex um, subject. And as we've talked about, the language can be quite dry. But I, I'm just keen to, to ensure that um, that message is getting across to members of the public and residents who uh, may not necessarily know what goes on behind the scenes. And in order from, um, you know, uh, in terms from my perspective about ensuring that residents feel that their, their views are, are sort of uh, are being sort of heard and their voices are being heard it would be good if there was a two-way process in that we we don't shy away from explaining about the difficulties and the increased challenges um that we will continue to face um as a uh, sort of a, in the year or two ahead thank you Thank you, Gemma. Do you want to come back in? Just, just to very briefly come back on that. I, I mean, um, I think the kind of a engagement consultation piece is is really important to the budget setting, and it can be really challenging to do that well. And and we are um, having conversations about how we can um, engage differently, but also explain um, the council's budgetary um, situation differently. Um, to engage people better, but also um, to get them our, our kind of message and challenges across um, in a better in a better way. And I think we're all always happy to um, have that discussion with members and, and hear their thoughts around potential alternative ways of coming at that engagement piece. Thanks, Gemma. Um any other questions on uh, quarter one revenue monitoring? Councillor Johnson, over to you. Um, Dear, just and an Gloria. Really quickly, two points that I'd like to raise in relation to savings. I don't know if it's possible to receive an answer this evening, but one thing which comes up red in the appendix from social services is something called closer to home residential care children and young people and it states that this is something that this will go live in the autumn this year is there further information about this it's a hundred thousand pounds and also dock offices in the barry there are savings over two years of 300,000. How is this unfolding? As we await an agreement from the UK government in terms of regeneration funding, is there an update on this? Thank you. Are you okay if I could, I'll come in on the um, the docs office um, and then Gemma, if you could pick up the first uh, question. The um, there are a couple of um, sources of funding that we're waiting to hear on. One is the the town's fund, uh, the twenty million pounds we're awarding, and then also is is the the um, leveling up funding. Um, the um the director of place has been in, in regular contact with uh, uk government on on both of those um we're we are though waiting and we won't hear until uh, the time of the the chancellor's budget on the on the 30th of october certainly the the um the soundings from the civil servants are um still positive 
um, certainly um, on on the LUF money. Um, but yeah, we we won't know for sure until later this month. Um, in terms of the um, the residential and um, closer to home saving. Um, there are a number of um, savings in, in the children and young people's um, social services space that are around um, establishing um, provision um, within local communities. Um, and, and that could potentially be a really positive thing um, in terms of outcomes, as, as well as potentially um, reducing the, the cost of that provision as well. Um, and, and in and. And so they've been put forward as part of um, transformational proposals. Um, what's what's communicated to um, me and my, my finance colleagues a lot as part of that is obviously these are um, the children that we are um, moving. And so the timing of those um, of, of using that, the way that that provision can be used and um, moving children into those placements, it can be quite um tricky to get the, the right um, timing and um, to ensure that that placement is the right placement for the for the child. And so um, there is some lag on, on, on the um, implementation of those savings. But um, I think the kind of direction of and, and the, the choice to move those um, children into um, placements within the community it is definitely the right um, choice well it appears to be the right choice and um it's just the timing of, of the implementation of that saving that needs to be managed really carefully by the service um so it's hopeful that we'll we'll start to see um those savings achieved um either later this year or, or going into 25 26. thank you Gemma. um okay with that response councillor johnson do you, do you want to come back in? That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Good Thank you. Um, any other questions then on revenue monitoring? No? Okay, everybody. So um, we'll swiftly move on to the recommendations. And that was that the position with regards to the authorities' 24-25 revenue budget be no. Um, no yes that's right be noted and that the environments included as part of this report also are to be noted okay so if we can um if we're all happy to move to the next agenda item if i could have a hand to move please thanks councillor drake and councillor Vlock edwards okay so um we're moving on now to agenda item eight which is capital monitoring for the first quarter period april to June 24, and I think it's Gemma again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, so, um, as I said, with the previous report quite early in the in the financial year in terms of the quarter one position, um, and the spend is 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 quite low against um, a, a total program of um, over 130 million. Um, I think typically I'd expect to see more slippage um, against this program as we progress through the year. Um, and um, typically, we tend to see um, quite a lot of spend then over the um, the summer months and into the autumn. So, um, for instance, in schools, we tend to um, carry out a lot of the asset maintenance time schemes over the, the summer holidays when schools are um, closed. Um, and, and obviously, in terms of the housing um, um, schemes and the sustainable communities learning schemes obviously those schemes can progress quite quickly once on site um in terms of some of the key headlines of this report um as i say we've got an approved program of 139.927 million um, and that includes the 15 million of slippage from the 2324 program that was approved by emergency powers um there is um a revision of this programme down to 135 million um, and spend to the end of June was around 9 million. So Appendix 1 sets out the financial programme on the, um, progress on the capital programme to 30th of June. Appendix 2 is then the, the changes um, against the approved programme. Um, 
obviously the pressures around increasing construction costs are continuing to impact the programme and um, issues around tenders being received over the allocated budgets and, and the need to kind of go back and either renegotiate tenders or seek additional funding. Um, obviously, um, it's really important that officers continue to work with project managers and sponsors to ensure value for many within the programme and make sure that all pot uh, potential funding opportunities are identified. There are a few um, delegated authority requests which have been um, approved and noted within the report and some use of emergency powers. Um, as with the outturn report, we do try and highlight schemes that are um, have been included in the capital programme. So we have um, the news that some external funds have just short of four million been secured um, for transport grants from Welsh Government, um, some of which is for active travel schemes. And then secondly, um, a scheme that utilises Section 106 um, money um, at Celtic Way Park and play area in Roos is highlighted within the programme. There are a number of um, amendments to the capital programme, some of which include um, some changes around sustainable communities for learning, um, the removal of um, an early years and childcare scheme at St Athen, and the inclusion of a new scheme um, for um, conversion of um, C1V for Parkwood of 400,000, which utilises some um, SBF funding. Those are the key points I was going to highlight, but happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, Gemma. That was um, that was great. Uh, Councillor Johnson, would you like to come in first? Thank you. Thank you very much for the report, Gemma. Just a couple of questions from me. Obviously, the original plan this year was 140 million of spend comparing to a little over a hundred thousand last year or 100 million last year sorry so this is significantly higher so i ask obviously it's early in the year with this report but it's less uh, early in real time, given that we're in October at this point, are we confident that we're spending that money in the way that we intended? For example, I see slippage of five million for Scolidari until next year, and of course, this is in quarter one, so this is before issues with the site and constructors at the moment are we also confident with the work in relation to richard gwynn and the projects in the pipeline in this project and one other point the last point we mentioned earlier about lending or borrowing money for capital work for the construction of new housing as the spend is significantly higher this year compared to past how are we funding all of this thank you um in terms of the um delivery of the capital program and the slippage i think as i indicated when i delivered the report i absolutely expect there to be further um slippage in in the capital program um i i don't expect us to achieve 135 million pound of um expenditure and i expect there to be more slippage um forthcoming so um we have seen historically um some changes um, and, and those changes can be quite significant in terms of delivery of sustainable communities for learning and some of the other um, budgets that are shown against pipeline schemes um, I expect to be um, reprofiled and some of this is around um, delays on delivery of schemes and, and some of the complexities of, of tendering these really large um, schemes and, and getting them on site 
Um, and some of them is, is around optimism um, of um, people around um, delivery timescales. Um, and um, we do try and work um, really closely and challenge um, project managers around how they profile their schemes in the programme, because obviously the impacts the availability of other funding um, to be utilised for um, the schemes that are very much needed, that the funding in the capital programme is very tight and um, will be even more challenging as we as we go forward. Um, but um, certainly there is a, such a broad range of challenges in terms of delivering a capital programme. Um, that we have lots more work to do in terms of, of getting realistic profiles um, within the within the capital program, and, and we will continue to work with project managers to try and do that. Um, but I do, I, I do appreciate the challenges with such significant um, and complex schemes um, within the program as well. In terms of the um, housing improvement program and, and the sheer. Um, size of it, there is there is significant borrowing included within the um, the treasury management strategy for twenty four twenty five and ongoing. Actually, um, I think there's some um, quite long term projections within the um, the treasury management strategy, um, which was brought back in um, February, um, and um, and that shows borrowing at around 40 million throughout the program so some really high levels of um, investment proposed for um, the housing improvement program and obviously that includes new builds and um, development but also um, the cost of meeting um, some of the environmental and um, um, energy efficiency improvements and WHQS um, 2023 as well in the housing space. Um, we do have a preferential rate for um, housing borrowing um, and we have undertaken some tranches of borrowing um, at the start of this financial year um, and we will continue to keep rates under review. Um, we do tend to be quite cautious around the timing of our borrowing. Obviously, interest rates are um, quite high at the moment. So we've got a kind of eye on um, on the direction of, of where we think interest rates will go. And we have projections from our independent treasury management advisor. Um, and they also use an external third party as well to feed into those um, projections as, as an extra um, point of rigour in the process. And we also um, keep under review the kind of progress of the capital programme as well to minimise that borrowing in advance of need um, to make sure that um, we're not costing the authority in the housing revenue account in terms of borrowing at high interest le um, levels before that amount is actually um, required. So we have done some initial borrowing, but we'll need to um, continue to keep that under review in the context of the progress of the scheme and the direction that we think borrowing rates are going to take. So hopefully, Councillor Johnson, that answers your question. Um, but happy to clarify a bit more if, if that's helpful. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Gemma. Um, I think I saw a hand there from Councillor Hamilton. I don't know if he... Has a, a question he wants to ask, or if it? Um... No, sorry, Chair. Um, that was my fault. Ah, <laughs> no, no, no. Don't, don't you worry about it. That's fine. Thank you. Um, a quick question and rolled up in a suggestion from me, um, Gemma, because um, I understand the pressures that we're under when it comes to um, our tenders and receiving. Um, then bids that exceed our budgets, and then what do we do about that? And it's um, it's a perennial problem. So my question, as I said, rolled up in a suggestion, is whether we would consider um, trying a slightly different approach. Um, so so when we actually commission and we have our budget plus um, historical pricing that we know we we can afford, whether we actually publish. Um, a fixed capped price and we say that any bids that exceed will be disqualified and and try it and see and see what happens because um because you might be quite quite surprised that then the bids will come in um on uh, on on budget and anyway, thank you 
Um, thank you, Chair, and absolutely happy to take that um, to the team as a suggestion um, and, and take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All new approaches are worth a go because in the end, if we keep doing things the same way, we're going to get the same results. So that's a, that's a quite a, um obvious thing to say, but it is true. Okay, do we have any other other questions on um, on this particular agenda item? No? Okay, that's, that's great. So let's move swiftly to the recommendations. And they were that the progress on delivering 2425 capital programme be noted um, at Appendix 1, that the use of the delegated authority within the remit of our committee be noted, the use of emergency powers within the remit of this committee, Appendix 1 be noted, um, and then also that the changes to the capital programme and future years capital programme be noted. So that those were our recommendations. So if I can have a hand to move, please. Thank you, Councillor Goodjohn and Councillor Drake. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, if we move now on to agenda item nine, which is the financial strategy 2526 to 292030. And I think, again, this is a reference that's come from Cabinet on the 18th of July. Matt, over to you. Thank yeah, you. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce this. And obviously, it, it's um, not surprising how things change over, to, over just a matter of month. So I will give some little updates where things have changed a little bit, perhaps since the, uh, the time of writing um, this report. Um, so it does set out our approach uh, to setting the 2025-6 budget and the, the medium-term financial plan out to 29-30. Um, there's been, um, I think with this report, we've, we've made some changes how we've pulled it together um, compared to the last couple of years. I think there is, um, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of focus on, on the pressures on savings when we're talking about the budget. Um, so we've um, attempted to do some awareness raising and it ties in with, with some of the earlier comments this evening um, on what we actually spend our money on, um, how we're funded and how that compares with, with others. So there's certainly a, bit, um, a greater amount of content on the front of the report um, on that than we've, we've perhaps done in the previous couple of years. Um, we're and also in in line with the um, some some comments that we've just had. Um, we're starting to think about even now about what we do when we do the MTFP refresh um, to cabinet um, in November, which will come after the UK budget. And we're, we're talking about uh, some early public awareness um, activity that we might do around um, that time. Uh, so going back back to the report, the um, we are the third lowest spend ahead across um, Wales. Um, this we are relatively low funding uh, funded as an authority, and we also um, set uh, a relatively low rate of council tax, um, and that's really important context for the, for our financial strategy. Um, also importantly is the um, lack of flexibility that we have in our spending um, with 81 percent of it now committed to education housing social care and council tax support and we know with an increasing proportion of the budget directed to those services year on year we've um, we've held firm with our overall financial um, strategy and that's set out in 2.8 onwards the focus, of course, is um, delivering the corporate plan um, that is uh, being refreshed this year, and along with a, a, a similar timeline to the budget setting. And I know the work that um, Tom and team are doing on that. Um, there are plans for, for consultation and certainly face-to-face um, -face consultation with um, members and public on, on that work. Um, as you all know, it's a, a really challenging time for local government, um, and we reflected in the report in um, July that that would be the case, uh, whatever the outcome of the general election. And I think early, early in, we're, we're, we're seeing that um, to be the case. 
Um, we know there's been a prolonged um, period of high inflation, contributed to high interest rates and low growth, and that does limit um, the options for government. July's inflation figures, which we reported on in the in the report, um, were released um, after uh, around the time of the cabinet, and were higher than hoped for, um, which was likely to have an outcome on the the MPC meeting at the time. It was the next one was the first of um, August. Naturally, since the time of writing, things have moved on. Um, we've finally seen interest rates coming down uh, 0.25%. Um, but despite inflation now being broadly in line with uh, Treasury targets, um, there is potential upward pressure on inflation and the MPC hasn't um, felt uh, sufficiently confident to act further. Um, so prospects of further interest rate cuts are, are still... Um, not, not, not highly likely. Um, locally, we've seen um, unemployment picking up, albeit claimant counts are relatively static. But I think one of the stark um, features that the, the strategy um, picks up is that increase in private sector rents up 18% over the uh, the past two years across the Bay of Morgan. That's quite a, a staggering number. We've rolled the medium-term financial plan on from March's council meeting um, when the 24-5 budget was set. Um, so we've rolled the 25, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8 numbers, and then we've added an extra year on the end for 29, 30. Um, so the gap at this stage of the 25, 6 is 9.4 million pounds and a gap of 35 over the plan. Um, at Cabinet meeting in July, there's an acknowledgement of emerging pressures and the likelihood that these figures would grow following the detailed planned review of cost pressures that we set out to do um, across the summer and early autumn. Um, we've just taken you through the quarter one monitoring on the agenda, so these um, pressures are certainly very, very apparent. Um, we've completed our first review of the cost pressures and there'll be a further review of those before we come back to Cabinet um, with the MTFP refresh in November following the Chancellor's um, budget at the end of the end of this month now. Um, and, and certainly that, that nine million pounds will have will have grown um, significantly. Um, there's a change in focus um, with the um, strategy this year. Um, so identifying measures to address the gap with transformation and reshaping plan to come to the fore be head of uh, ahead of tactical savings that we've seen dominating the, the budget setting over the last um, couple of years. There's a detailed uh, report on the programme to Cabinet in January and officers are working through a number of initiatives to be brought forward later in the year. Um, the Council Reshaping Perspective has had sign off at officer level now and that's going to come forward to Cabinet later this month and there'll be regular updates uh, that, that follow that. Um, we're working closely with, uh, through the pressures and reshaping ideas with officers and cabinet members at this time, and we'll continue to do so over the next couple of months. Um, links to some of the comments that made around outturn um, our reserves are really important at this time, um, and making sure that they match our risks as those risks changes. So that will be a piece of work that will we'll on, ongoing. We'll continue to. Um, review our reserves and whether we're holding in the right places. Um, there are going to be a, a, a number of reports coming through now over the next couple of months, not dissimilar to our approach over the last couple of years. So we'll have the refresh, as I've said, in November, and then we'll have a, a budget for consultation in January. Um, and over that period, um, there'll be continuous engagement on our work with our schools, our residents, other interest groups and um, scrutiny, of course. Um, the we did, and as I've just mentioned, we highlighted in the report the um, Chancellor's UK budget at the end of October uh, being an important point in time. At the time of writing the um, report, um, wasn't fully cognizant of the date for the Welsh settlement. Um, that's now looking 11th of December, um, slightly earlier than last year, but still um, gives us a really 
challenging job to do to be pulling budget proposals together to go forward in January. Um, so that's all I'm saying. Introduction, obviously, um, real, real challenging time for us. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, yes, it is. Uh, it's. It seems to me that it's been a challenging two, nearly three years with costs. But, um, but yeah, um, we can only look forward to a good settlement this year and cross everything. Um, do we have any questions, please, from committee? on the financial strategy. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, my, my entire question. Uh... Less of a question and more of a statement. We've had a decade, a difficult decade, in local government because of the shortfall of funding coming from Westminster and then being allocated by Welsh government. So hopefully by the end of the month, We'll receive some good news from the Chancellor in terms of the money coming Wales's way. And then from the ministers in Cardiff Bay to Welsh to the local authorities to meet the increasing pressures in a number of the areas that we've already heard about during the meeting, which was a meeting to all intents and purposes just to discuss the financial situation, one thing we know will be helpful will be to have a settlement or at least an idea of the settlement over a year only. If we get three years, this will at least be able to help us with forward planning and we'll hopefully face less of the situations that we have faced over the years where we get funding for one year only, which means that we have to wait until the last moment with Welsh Government making statements in the week or two before Christmas. It's difficult for our staff to prepare then over winter and to bring plans to us or suggestions to us because of course we need to complete the budget preparation work by a set date in March so hopefully it'll be a good idea if the UK government or when they set the budget and the expenditure comprehensive spend review that this will give us some sort of consistency and certainty in terms of the budget that we have for three years and then that we can receive the same thing from Welsh Government instead of each year waiting until the last moment to establish an understanding of what will be happening in future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goodjohn. Um, a three-year settlement would sounds like a really, really good thing. Um, Let's see what happens. Councillor Good, John. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask three questions, um, if I may, uh, to Matt. Um, firstly, because I ask this every year, um, I want to ask about pay uh, and why you've made the estimates, uh, well, the guesses that you've made now. Um, a little bit of maths tells me that you've budgeted, well, you haven't budgeted yet, but uh, you're guessing about 2% pay award. We've seen um, recently the public sector pay awards uh, granted in England, and obviously we will see in December fully uh, what happens here in Wales, but it feels to me like an underestimate. I wonder what your thoughts are on a 2% if you are prepared to budget for more? Thank you, um, Councillor John. Your, your maths is right. Um, the um, the forecast back in um, March was was 2% in the, in the future years. Um, and the basis of that is that that's the, um, the Treasury's target for inflation, which is a um, not an exact proxy, but it's certainly a good, uh, a decent enough proxy for how um, pay goes. 
um, we've naturally seen um, some catching up on the pay awards for the current um, financial year. Um, they're certainly going to put pressure on us in 2024-5 um, and um, we're likely going to have to make um, some adjustment into our base budget as a, as a consequence of that. Um, we've also had the survey with um, the Society of Welsh Treasures, which we've, we're starting to see some of the output from um, you know, input into that um, late summer, early autumn. Um, so we have got information in front of us about what others are forecasting as well. So we're, we could be taking that into account um, and we'll take that into account when we refresh the MTFP later this month to come to Cabinet in November. Uh, thank you, Matt and, and Chair, if I may. Um, to me, 2% feels low considering the consistently high interest rate set by the Bank of England, which um, it seems to be that pay is following more closely than inflation rates at the moment. But um, that, that's a, a whole nother point um, to make. So uh, the second thing is every time we come to revenue monitoring, um, we seem to find ourselves with a overspend in social services, which is totally understandable to see with current pressures. But often this is offset by uh, an underestimate uh, when it comes to savings from internal borrowing, but also an overestimate in financing costs because of the ad hoc nature of grants that we're receiving in our capital program. Has there been any work to improve the modelling of trying to find when we uh, are going to receive grants and how likely it is that we are to receive grants for capital uh, projects later down the line? Um, and if there's been any work into better modelling uh, the situation of financing uh, our capital programmes? Um, if there's been any work, that would be great to hear. Otherwise, um, I would say that this has been a consistent problem year on year. Um, there's an inability to, to um, estimate these two elements of the budget. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Councillor John. We, we, we do seem to alight on this on an annual basis. I think the the, um, my response would be about um, the time at which we're actually setting the budget. It's some way out um, ahead of the actual financial year. We do have um, a really accurate cash flow model that the, the Treasury team um, uh, manage on, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, but I think we, we do have to be relatively prudent conservative when we're, when we're setting the budget about what some of those um upsides might be um we have um push we've put some of that into the budget um for 24 5 but still on a relatively conservative basis um i think the best i can offer at the moment is that we that we regularly monitor and monitor that and update on it during during the course of the year um i'm not sure whether Gemma wants to make any co further comments about the um uh, the cash flow, um, but it is cash flow management is um, is tricky more more on the capital side than the, the revenue. We, we know some of our you know major outgoings in, in terms of salaries and, and timings of revenue support grant and council tax coming through. Um, obviously, the the capital program and the, the grants around that and the, the spend are a little bit more volatile, um, but uh, quite a challenge. Um, sorry, Councillor Goodjohn, just to come in very, very briefly. Um, so in terms of um, the um, cost of capital financing, obviously some of it's around um, use of reserves and projections around um, use of reserves. And um, we are trying to tie up those reserve projections a lot in a lot more um, detail Um but obviously we, we, we're continuing to, to get it slightly wrong and that obviously impacts the um the 
ability of the the council to internally borrow um, and therefore then the, the borrowing position of the council and the borrowing costs that the council is exposed to. Um, another obviously are the, the key factors that's influencing those kind of um, capital financing decisions is around um, the the position of the capital program and the delivery particularly of the housing improvement program because we have very little um borrowing outside of that but also the slippage on sustainable communities for learning and as we've we've talked those are such complex um schemes we do tend to see quite significant amounts of slippage in that area so that can impact the kind of capital financing thing obviously the complication also is that that borrowing is we know that we'll need that capital financing ultimately because um we know that reserves will will be spent um, other than the, the kind of £30 million buffer that we've said that we'll maintain. Um, so any kind of saving that we can take will be on a temporary basis um, because, um, as you've seen, we've, we're £55 million as a council, including HRA, um, internally borrowed, and we won't be able to sustain that level of um, internal borrowing as we start to use up our um, reserves. But cash flow does complicate that, as as does kind of grant sums also. Um, sorry to go on a little bit about that point. No, that that's uh, that's extremely interesting and important to hear about because every time that one of these um, housing capital projects, for example, uh, is delayed due to circumstances outside of this council's control, it, it does have an impact on our cash flow as a whole. I think it's it's important uh, to note that. Um, I think the final thing would be to do with invest to save. Uh, projects and um, we've already spoken previously um, about investing in training for example for governors to try and improve scrutiny uh, in schools to improve uh, budgetary capacity to improve financial skills uh, uh, and save money I wonder if um, there is any scope for other investors to save programs to do with the procurement, to do with trying to improve the procurement process, um, as we've seen already through the task and finish group and in many other circumstances. I think this is one of the areas where uh, the council is, is lagging behind other councils in Wales uh, when it comes to not just value for money, but also quality of the services that uh, provide, which in turn creates value for money in the long run uh, regarding what we procure. So, um, I, I wonder if there is any scope uh, to look at procurement as a invest to save project in the future uh, within this financial strategy. Um, I'd be interested as to uh, any thoughts, uh, possible problems, um, questions you'd have on that. Um, uh, and, and that would be everything from me. Nothing, nothing's off limits for our invest to save um, reserve and certainly can explore that. Um, I do need to be consistent with the sort of um, constraints I put my colleagues and expectations with them as well. Um, and it's actually about demonstrating um, the upside that we would have from that investment, but but certainly something I, I, I'm more than happy to explore. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matt and Councillor Goodjohn. Um, definitely a recommendation then that we um, look at the potential um, of spend to save project being a strategic procurement function. Um, it's definitely an element that is missing from the financial strategy. Um, the actual very drive and goal of a strategic procurement approach is to effectively manage your costs. And that is something when you look at the long term financial strategy would really benefit us. So I think that's definitely going to be a recommendation that comes from from us today. Do we have any other questions on the financial strategy from anybody? No. OK. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Um, let's move to recommendations were. They were that we review the financial strategy and assumptions made on the costs in the medium term financial plan 
refresh and we provide our comments back to Cabinet for consideration. So if our comments can go back, plus also the recommendations that as a uh, spend to save project, the proposal for um, a strategic procurement uh, function um, comes from us as well. That would be great. Do we have a hand to move, please, everybody? Thank you, Councillor John and Councillor Drake. Thank you. Um, let's move on then to agenda item 10, which was any other items the chairs decide is urgent part one. Um, we don't have any. Um, then we move to part two and the press public exclusion bit. We don't have any items for part two either to discuss tonight that... Um, that I've decided are urgent, so we can bring our meeting to a close. Um, thank you, everybody, for your participation. Uh, I think it's been been quite an interesting one and definitely um, an interesting and um, helpful scrutiny, I think, is, is, is the best way to describe this. If we um, can look at the next meeting now, Hopefully we won't need to have two next month, but but we we can see, and if we do, we will. Um, I think it's the third third Wednesday, isn't it? In not yeah, twenty third of October, chair. Yeah, so it's the twenty third of October, everybody at six o'clock. So enjoy the rest of your evening, and um, thanks everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you.